Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Tato Katoa, Ko Andrew Henry Aho, Hei Kaimahi Aho, Mo Napataka Korero, or Tamaki Makoto. As Sarah just said, I'm Andrew. I work as the principal New Zealand Aotearoa Collections Librarian at Auckland Libraries. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a book. It's a, a bit of a mystery book when I first encountered it, um, and it turned out that it's a book that shouldn't exist. Uh, the book's called Freiburg's Bend by Eric Halstead. It was kind of almost published by Heinemann Reed in 1989. Um, at that stage, Heinemann Reed were a subsidiary of uh, Octopus Publishing. And before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the donors of this book that I'm going to talk about today. Um, but at this stage, we'll keep them anonymous because I haven't accessioned the donation yet, uh, mostly because I haven't been in the library for the last three months. Uh, so the human and institutional dynamics of the book's production and production and consumption is the key part of this quote that I'm going to talk about today. We're going to look at the social circumstances around its production and the decade-long journey of the text and the operations of power that led to get it published and then ordered destroyed. It is in fact a story of an ind individual exercising an incredible amount of agency to see his book into print, only to be ultimately disappointed. So how did this copy of Freiburg's Men come to our attention? As I said before, the mystery began when we were talking to some prospective donors. Um, unfortunately, given the space restrictions in our library, we can't, I imagine this is the same for many libraries, we no longer really accept um, authors' libraries in one, in their sort of entirety. Uh, so as a um, compromise, my, um, colleague and manuscripts and archives curator, um, you know, accepted, accessioned the uh, papers and digital storage media and what have you. But as a way of um, sort of acknowledging it, we, we photographed the library in the workspace and then listed it. So you can see the book in situ here. Um, as I was listing the books, um, sometimes they're unfamiliar to me, I'd do a search. And as you can see from my search here, there were no copies of this book in Aotearoa. Um, or any library in the world. So my curiosity was piqued. I opened a Google search tab, found a single copy for sale at Hard to Find Books, uh, still available last week, as of last week. Uh, the next thing on the Google results was uh, the Wikipedia page of the author. It turns out Eric Halstead had been a prominent politician. There was only one sentence on his Wiki page, however, relating to this book, but the footnote led to the history of the eminent Aotearoa publishing house, Reid. Uh, the title of that book is Whare Raupo by Gavin McLean from 2007. In a section in that book entitled Word Theft, there's a few brief pages detailing this incident. The author's ref Halstead is referred to as a hack and, and an incompetent thief. So um, the plot began to thicken. I was thinking to myself, what is this book? How did it get published and then destroyed? And why not this copy? Uh, the newspapers of the day covered the story. This was the headline from the Evening Post's billboards that would have been seen by Wellington commuters on the 2nd of November 1989. Um, Halstead claimed in the press that politics and personalities were to blame for the book's holdup. He even goes so far as to threaten Dr Michael Bassett, who was the Minister of Internal Affairs, with legal action. Um, in correspondence with Dr Bassett, he has no really recollection of the plagiarism controversy. Uh, it seemed extraordinary that the book could reach this stage of production and then be ordered destroyed. Um, also in the press, it says there's 4,000 copies sitting at the wharves in Auckland. And to quote McLean in the Reed history, the company were begging newspapers to return review copies. Uh, so today I'd like to look at the operations of power that led to this situation. Uh, to better understand the story of this book, we need to more look at its uh, publishing history, as well as the plagiarism and politics referred to in the title of the paper. The operations of power that inform the story are the power and privilege of Eric Halstead himself, um, perhaps conferred by the institutions of its usual part, um, the power of the market economy, and ultimately the power of governments, the rule of law. And you can see there's some interesting quotes in this article from Halstead, including the title, um, this won't be the finish of the argument, I don't accept it won't be published, and you can also see down the bottom there his threat of legal action. 
Um, so the book was an outcome of a decade long publishing journey, which we can trace back to 1980. This image is the cover of a 220 page file created by the historical branch of the Department of Internal Affairs. As you can see, it was opened in the 1980 and then finally closed 10 years later in September of 1990. It begins with Halstead requesting permission to republish some 99 maps and other material from Army Board surveys for a war history. Um, at the start, there's some amicable letters between Halstead and Ian Wards, the Chief Government Historian at the time, but then moves to show repeated rejections from the historical branch for the use of the Crown copyright materials. Um, this file is in Archives New Zealand. I was looking forward to a research trip to Wellington, but um, COVID intervened. But the flip side of that is this digitised copy is now available through Archway, so anyone else who is interested can peruse the 220 pages at your leisure. I think it's worthwhile at this stage to look a bit more closely at the biography of the author. Uh, these two portraits of Halstead were taken by Clifton Firth 20 years apart from 1945 and 1965. Uh, Eric Halstead, CBE ED, was educated at Auckland Grammar School, then the Teachers Training College and the University of Auckland. While at university, he was the president of the Students Association. This begins a familiar strand that you can see throughout his career. He was not just sort of comfortable in these various institutions and organisations that shaped his life, but he was um, heavily involved in them and often held positions of power. Um, he was the Auckland Council for, Councillor for the New Zealand Institute of Industrial Management. He was the head of department for the commercial department at Seddon Technical College, where he introduced a business course and papers on management. He went on to become a senior partner in a firm of chartered accountants in Auckland. He was the vice president of the Auckland Junior Chamber of Commerce. He was a member of the Auckland University Council from 1964 to 1970. He was on the boards of Air New Zealand, the Auckland Savings Bank, amongst others. So you can see he um, sort of moved comfortably in this world and held many, many positions of power. As well as um, being a member of parliament, he was a member of parliament for Tamaki from 1949 to 1957. He was also a cabinet minister. He held various portfolios, including Minister of Social Security, Minister of Industries and Commerce, Minister of Customs, and Minister Assisting the Prime Minister. After he was out of Parliament, he was the Vice President of the National Party for six years. He was New Zealand Ambassador to Thailand and Laos from 1970 to 74, and the Ambassador to Italy from 1976 to 1980. Um, his appointment to these diplomatic posts was seen as a political appointment, according to a listener article from the time, which um, praises the party Halstead and his wife Millicent through for the visiting editor of, editor of Landfall, Peter Smart, and favourably compares it to those held by career diplomats. The profile also says Halstead contributed art criticism to the Atlantic Monthly and the Saturday Evening Post. Um, I had a brief search of their online archives and couldn't find either piece. Okay, I've, met, I've um, buried the lead here a little bit. Um, Halstead also served in the army. This is the author's photo on the dust jacket of Freiburg's men. He was in the New Zealand Expeditionary Force from 1941 to 1945. Originally started um, in the infantry, then rose to major. He was, during this time, he was appointed to the, uh, be the official archivist of the NZEF. Of course, later on, he was also on the executive of the Auckland branch of the RSA. Correspondence in that DIA file shows that Halstead certainly felt like his role as archivist had already done much of the work where the official war histories came from. Um, in a letter to the chief historian, he claims responsibility for six of the campaign booklets. Uh, quote, the first six booklets were based on the narrative of the official archives section was written by myself, initially directly from the war diaries, he quote. However, uh, Robin Kay, an author of one of the histories and also another NZEF archivist, writes into this, uh, writes into the historical branch of the DIA saying that that's untrue and that Halstead was cribbing work even back then. Um, so this is the beginning of the saga or the fiasco as Gavin McLean refers to it in the history of Reid. Um, so the point of showing the extent of Halstead's privilege is to show how he could be taken seriously when he informs the ministry and ministers after they de deny him um, access to Crown copyright that he simply says he'll simply wait until the government changes. Uh, which is an option unavailable to many first-time authors. The next and perhaps more obvious force at work in the story is the profit imperative of our market economy. The publishers anticipated making a good profit off this book. 
having uh, lived and worked through the recent centennial commemorations for the First World War, I can certainly understand the eagerness of Reid to have a short readable history on booksellers for the 50th anniversary of the Second World War. It would have been the first general overview of New Zealand and Egypt and Italy and the Middle East in World War II. So some way down my um, list of results on my Google search, I found the book mentioned in the archives of the military history publisher, Leo Cooper, possibly well known as, well known as Jilly Cooper, the novelist's husband. His archives are held at the University of Reading. Um, it also happened Cooper was a well-known publisher of military history in the UK, who was at the time under the wing of Octopus Publishing. So as you can see here, he's already agreed to buy 500 copies of uh, Freiburg's Men. Reads Andrew Campbell, also in this archive, says he's happy to send the copies straight from Singapore where they were printed, but the holdups mean that couldn't happen. Um, it's interesting to note this note is 20th of December. So this is six weeks after the billboards that the um, announcing the plagiarism in New Zealand. Um, in the press, it said the book cost $32,000 to produce. So with 4,000 copies, with an RRP of 45 New Zealand dollars, that's revenue of around 180. According to the Reserve Bank's uh, inflation calculates around $350,000 in today's currency. So um, you can see why it would have seen perhaps worth the headaches and gamble that Reid took to get it printed. Part of the back and forth between Reid and internal affairs involved Reid offering to affix a note on the copyright page, acknowledging the Crown copyright and providing them with a cash payment. Um, there are various iterations of this note in the DIA file. At this stage, it looked as though it had some chance of being published with a note and a $30,000 payment. And you can see how the workings on this slide here show um, how the DIA decided to ask for that much. However, Alan Smith from Reed came back with a $5,000 offer, which was seen as pitiful. But I think it is noteworthy to see, like even with their fierce objections, the government historians were prepared to settle on a work that they really didn't want to see come into print. It looks that begins to uh, look like that the law doesn't appeal, appear, apply to some people, excuse me. Um, this is another interesting um, point about the profits involved in this book. You can see here, this is a note from the historical department that this was the third case of plagiarization already from the war histories. So they were certainly worried about its value, commercial value, but, um, well, times change because these are all, all the official New Zealand war histories are now available online at the NZ ETC via Victoria University. Um, ultimately, the power that the government wields, the, the rule of law, um, in this case, the Copyright Act of 1962 uh, was the major operation of power. I mean, I don't believe there's much of an argument that the book wasn't plagiarized. You can see here notes on the manuscript saying that whole chunk was directly cribbed from um, the Crete history by Dan Devon. Um, there's dozens and dozens of pages like this in the DIA file. Uh, in reviewing the book for the Dominion Post, the well-known military historian Chris Pugsley undertook to prove the plagiarism. Quote from Pugsley in this review, in checking his detail, I compared Robin Kay's Italy volume two to the official, of the official history to Halstead's chapter, The Final Advance on Trieste. The opening paragraphs of Halstead's chapter are taken verbatim and unacknowledged from K page 388, and a further paragraph on the same page is taken from 389, end quote. Pugsley goes on to point out other examples. He has checked and declares Halstead and Heinemann Reed have broken the rules and taken other people's work as their own. The DIA file also includes these two um, amazing quotes from subsequent chief of government historians. Uh, Ian Ward's called it, the most blatant piece of plagiarism that I've ever seen. And then Ian McGibbon said, it could, if published, become famous as New Zealand's greatest work of plagiarism. Um, this is the reference page in the back of Freiburg's Men. Uh, Pugley, Pugsley points out there are 26 acknowledgements in his footnotes, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's also a heavily illustrated book, but the extent to which the photos are referenced is a note at the start saying that they're all from the war collection history at the Turnbull Library, except one on page six from New Zealand Herald. And looking at this reference page, it um, looks like Halstead either just sort of gave up or made a, a very half-hearted effort at it. 
Uh, this image is taken from Ian McGibbon's advice to the Internal Affairs Legal Department. And the highlight's mine, but the underline is, um, is in the file. And it's nice that Pugsley specifically mentioned the publishers in his review in the press, because the press coverage was mainly focused on Halstead. And then Gavin McLean puts all the blame on the author and Fare Daupo. I mean, perhaps not surprising, considering it's a commissioned history of Reed. Um, the file also shows that Heinemann uh, were involved in this controversy from at least 1987. And the quotes from the press at the time, like Reader quoted as saying, we're unwilling to say why publication proceeded. And then astonishingly, the book's editor is overseas. So here is the book. I think the question remains, however, like when facing such a clear director from the DIA historical branch that the book was allowed to be sent to the printers and then have 4,000 copies arrive and I'll tell you. I mean, the saga slash fiasco seems to have finally come to a rest when after the government changed, there is a letter from the MP Jenny Kirk asking for it to be published again. In response, the Minister of Defence, Peter Tapsell, denies this request. Um, the Minister of Defence had the copyright on the Army Board surveys, which made up most of the book. So I think the publishers certainly deserve more of the blame than they've been given. But even taking that into account, did they just trust in the hubris of Halstead and that Crown copyright really didn't apply to his book or that you really couldn't copyright a bloody war? Did the publishers abdicate their responsibilities with regards to copyright and hopes of profit? It's hard to imagine this happening for other books. I believe there's kind of a gap in the story or a silence in the archives, if you will. I checked the editorial papers from the Reed Records from at Turnbull Library covering the 1980s and there is no mention of this or Halstead. So even with this huge amounts of documentation, I think there are more avenues to explore. Um, colleagues and special collections at Auckland University have a manuscript collection of all Eric Halstead's paper, which I haven't been able to access, but that holds possibilities for future research. There's also an oral history interview with him held at Turnbull Library in which he talks about his interest in military history, so that will be worth a listen as well. The telling of the story in the history of Reed, Whareiropo, and in the newspapers of the day doesn't do it justice, I believe. Um, so how did this copy survive? You can imagine my delight when I first opened the book and saw this wonderful note, dated 12th January 1990. So that's six weeks out again after the uh, headlines in the newspapers saying the book's canned for plagiarism. Underneath that note was the slip. So it looks like this was one of the review copies that Reid were begging the newspapers to return. Uh, thanks for listening. Nami nui kia koutou katoa.